Okay, in the last video we covered 30 things you probably didn't know about the new MacBook Pros and in this one I want to give you guys my overall thoughts on them and if I think they're actually worth the upgrade. And the first thing that I want to address is the new design as this is actually what I was looking forward to the most. And I have to say, I am a bit disappointed here. We didn't get the rumored matte black color or the super flat look, we didn't get the super thin bezels and instead we got the same chin and a notch. We got a design that shows me that Apple was focusing on functionality and features first, and considering that this is a pro laptop, that's how it should have always been. But I just cannot ignore the notch. I think that uh, many would have preferred a slightly worse front camera in favor of the same uniform bezel at the top, just like we have on Dell's XPS line. I think the worst part of the notch is that it doesn't offer Face ID. Instead, it is just a better front-facing camera that takes up loads of space. My take is that Apple is planning on putting Face ID next year and that they wanted to have one big feature that they intentionally left out to have something big for next year. That's, that's my take. Now, the way the notch works is quite interesting, actually. It basically only shows up when the menu bar is also visible, meaning that when you're in a full screen app, that entire top portion of the display would actually turn black, essentially giving you the top bezel back. And the display's aspect ratio in that case would be the old 16 by 10. But Apple stated that if developers want to take advantage of that extra vertical space, they can. So we might see some apps having some buttons on the left and right hand side of the notch. Okay, now something else that changed design wise is the keyboard, which now has this black background around it. And it looks to me as if Apple literally took a magic keyboard from the iMac, spray painted it in black and placed it on top of a MacBook Pro. That also means that we no longer have the touch bar and instead we have the regular function keys, which are now the same size as they are on the iMac's keyboard. So no more half-sized ones. Now, I gotta be honest, I'm not a fan of Apple killing the touch bar. I mean, sure, adding regular function keys is great, but I still think that they should have kept the touch bar, but moved it slightly higher up. I only use it for adjusting the brightness or the volume, but there are cases like changing the font color in some apps Apps where it is indeed useful to have. Still, the fact that it kept crashing, even on my M1 MacBook Pro, shows that Apple never managed to figure out how to make it work properly. This, and the lack of support from developers, was ultimately the reason why it failed. But anyway, I do actually like how the new keyboard looks, and I think that the silver model this year is especially nice because of that harsh black and silver contrast. I went with a space gray myself because I'm a sucker for space gray, I guess. Probably a bit too much. The Apple logo on the back is now matte black as opposed to the shiny look that we had before. Still not as good as the glowing Apple logo, but I do think that it will stand out more than what we had with the 2016 generation. I'm also glad to see Apple including more ports. Specifically, I am glad to see three Thunderbolt ports, just like I predicted, instead of two like we had with the M1 MacBook Pro. And the third one is now on the right hand side, which means that you can now charge your MacBook Pro from whichever side you want. The SD card slot is also back, and I'm happy to know that when I'm traveling and I have my camera with me, I won't have to pack an SD card adapter anymore. Also, if you want to quickly and cheaply expand your storage, you can just pop in, let's say, a one terabyte SD card. The speed, of course, will be much slower than the internal storage, but if you plan to use it for just storing photos or documents, it's more than fast enough for those. The HDMI is also back, although this is only an HDMI 2.0 port like on the 2012 Retina MacBook Pros, so it maxes out at 4K60. Personally, I will be using USB Type-C to connect to my monitor since they're all USB Type-C, which means that they will also keep my MacBook Pro charged, but I guess that if you want to connect it to an older monitor or a TV, then it is good to have HDMI built in. Oh, and if you do want to connect it to a 4K 120 display or 6K or even 8K, you do have those three Thunderbolt 4 ports for that. And then there is also MagSafe, which hasn't been seen on a MacBook since the 2012-2015 generation. I was a big fan of MagSafe back then, um, as it was super quick to connect, disconnect, and also prevented your MacBook from slamming onto the ground if someone tripped on the cable, but I don't see myself using MagSafe that much anymore. And that's because I can still charge using the three Thunderbolt ports, so when I'm traveling, I'm just going to carry my power brick alongside a USB Type-C to USB Type-C cable that will also be able to charge not just my MacBook, but also my camera, my phone, Android phone that is, not iPhone unfortunately, but you get the idea. Plus when I'm at the office or at home, my monitor would automatically charge my MacBook through the USB Type-C port. So I just don't see myself using MagSafe at all. But what I would definitely be using is the new faster charging, 50% in 30 minutes. 
for which you do need that faster 96 watt power adapter. I actually found out that this actually works via a USB Type-C cable too, so you don't need to be using MagSafe on the 14-inch model. Now, on the 16-inch model you do, as that one has a much larger battery, which does require more power, which USB Type-C cannot deliver. A fun fact that massive 140-watt MacBook Pro 16-inch charger is actually Apple's very first gallium nitride charger, as 140-watt chargers are normally much bigger than that. So I think that if you're just looking at the design alone and the new ports, those alone are enough to warrant an upgrade as we haven't really had a redesign in five years and we haven't had a MacBook with this many ports since the 2015 MacBook Pro. And now let's talk about the display. You see, I always found the 2016 MacBook Pro's generation display to be one of the best for content creation. The contrast was great, the display was very bright at 500 nits, which um, might not seem much compared to a smartphone, but trust me, on a laptop, it is a lot, and it was also very accurate color-wise. But its new display is so much better in every single way. First, the displays are bigger, which is even more noticeable on the smaller model, which now has a 14.2-inch panel. Then second, the displays are significantly brighter. In fact, they can go as bright as 1600 nits of peak brightness or 1000 nits sustained. Now, this is very useful for when you're working with HDR content, but other than that, I don't actually think this increase in brightness would be noticeable, as even a 2021 12.9-inch iPad Pro, which seems to have the same exact display specs, maxes out at 600 nits in non-HDR content to save battery life. But even 600 would still be a jump from 500. Third, we now have the Mini LED technology, which was a bit controversial on the iPad Pro as it caused a lot of blooming, but the black levels were still much better than on an LCD panel. Not as good as OLED, but basically in between LCD and OLED. And since I don't read books on a dark background at night, I don't actually see blooming bothering me as much as it would on an iPad. And fourth, we also have ProMotion, which I was not expecting. I did talk about this in our previous What to Expect video that Ross Young and Dylan DKT have reported on this last minute, but I didn't expect to see more than the Mini LED technology. The fact that we got a 120Hz refresh rate, which is also dynamically adjustable, makes this the second biggest display upgrade that the MacBooks have ever received right after the Retina display. Now, I don't actually think that having a 120Hz panel is that important on a Mac, as number one, you don't really have any competitive games, and number two, interacting with the UI is done at a much slower pace when compared to a smartphone. So I don't think you're actually going to notice it that much, but when developers do start making games that do take advantage of the insane level of performance that these Macs can deliver, that's when the higher refresh rate would come in use. And speaking of Macs, when you buy a new Mac, one of the first things that you'll be doing is installing apps. This is why I think the very first app that you should install is Setup, our sponsor for this video. I use Setup on a daily basis. In fact, I'm actually a paying customer myself, so let me show you why. Let's say that I want my speakers to be louder, so I just type in volume. Setup has actually found an app called Boom that does just that. It increases the volume of my speakers more than what the normal maximum is. Just listen to this. This is before. And this is after. That's pretty insane. Oh, and I don't even have to buy Boom as it is part of Setup. And so are 220 plus more apps just as useful. You look for a task and Setup will give you the app you need. We even teamed up to give you my recommended list of apps. Just go to Collections and look for the Setup Tech Work Pack as it contains all the apps that I use and recommend. Try it for free for seven days by using the link below. And the last display upgrade is a slight bump in resolution and PPI. The advantage here is that the default resolution scaling would be half of the native resolution. Long story short, your max display will feel sharper and more retina than the previous retina display. So I think that if you have an older MacBook and you're looking to upgrade to this new one, even if you're not a pro user, the display is such a big upgrade that on its own makes it totally worth it. But the biggest upgrade that we got with this new generation is of course the performance. Even the baseline, the cheapest new MacBook Pro that you can buy, which is the lowest end 14 inch that starts at $2,000, so even that eight core M1 Pro CPU inside of it is more powerful than the M1 was, which was already the fastest laptop chip on the market, aside from Intel's newly released 11th gen chip at least. 
Um, now you can actually upgrade that to a 10 core CPU and in that case, it would be 70% faster than the M1. I do think that most people would be fine with the 8 core CPU, but if you need even more performance, you do have that option. The big improvements, however, are on the GPU side. The lowest and 14 inch model, which comes with a 14 core GPU, is just as powerful as the Radeon Pro 5500M, which was the second most powerful graphics card in the old 16-inch MacBook Pro. The fact that you basically get a better machine than the old 16-inch with a better display and a better keyboard for about half the price and in a smaller package is just incredible. But of course, that you can bump the GPU even more. The 16-core GPU outperforms the 5600M graphics, which was the highest-end GPU option in the 16-inch MacBook Pro, a machine that used to cost $4,200, more than double the price of the 14-inch model. You can then get the 24-core GPU that would match the Radeon RX 5700M, and if you get a 32-core GPU, that would match the Radeon Vega 56 inside the iMac Pro, and even outperform an RTX 3080 inside a compact gaming laptop such as the Razer Blade 15 Advanced. And then when compared to the MSI G76, which is the laptop that takes full advantage of the RTX 3080 mobile, uh, the MacBook Pro is very close in performance while drawing 100 watts less power. Also keep in mind that the MSI needs to be plugged in to achieve that performance, while the MacBook Pro can also do it on battery power. Of course, that there are no AAA games on macOS, but I do think that third-party developers would now start porting Windows games onto the Mac, as the performance limitations are no longer an issue. The popular Octane X renderer will be available for Apple Silicon later in the year, and will be able to take full advantage of these new chips. And loads of pro apps already do, like Adobe Suite, Logic Pro, Final Cut, DaVinci Resolve, and many more. So if you are a true pro user, I don't think there's ever been a better time to buy a new MacBook Pro. Now, if you're a video editor, I also think that you would benefit a lot from these new machines, as we not only get much better CPU and GPU performance, but we also get faster storage, up to 7.2 gigabytes per second, which is double of what we had before. And on top of all that, we also have dedicated hardware encoders and decoders for ProRes and ProRes RAW. So if you shoot in ProRes, or even if you don't, but you convert your footage into ProRes to edit faster, then these machines will be able to do that much quicker. The M1 Max chip, so the one with 24 or 32 GPU cores, that one has two ProRes decode and encode engines. So that chip will be twice as fast as the M1 Pro chip. But I don't think you will need that chip unless you work with 8K footage and ProRes, or you work with rendering applications that do require a lot of GPU power. So I think that the M1 Pro, so the one with uh, 14 or 16 GPU cores, is enough for most people, especially if you consider the GPU performance comparison that I showed you guys before. RAM-wise, we can go up to 64 gigabytes. And keep in mind that RAM on Apple Silicon is also more efficient and much faster as it is part of the SoC. And 16 gigabytes of RAM on the M1 was actually similar in performance to 32 gigabytes of RAM on Intel. So the 32 gigabytes of RAM model should be enough for pretty much anyone, but if you need more, you do have the option to go for 64 gigabytes. Also keep in mind that the GPU will use your RAM as video memory, so if you do 3D modeling or if you're a video editor working with a ton of effects, then getting the 64 gigabyte of RAM model would be useful as you would also have more video memory. So having said all of this, I think that the three best configurations are the following. Number one, the baseline 14 inch with the eight core CPU and the 14 core GPU and 16 gigabytes of RAM. You get a computer that's much more powerful than the M1 MacBook Pro with a GPU that matches the 5500M inside the 16 inch MacBook Pro. It costs $2,000, which of course is expensive, but it is $1,500 less than the old 16 inch model. Of course, you get a smaller display, but it is also a much better display. The second best option, in my opinion, is the 14-inch with the 10-core CPU, the 16-core GPU, and 32 gigabytes of RAM. So this would cost $2,700, so $700 more than the baseline, but you do get considerably better performance alongside that more powerful 96-watt charger, which does allow you uh, to have quick charging. Also, since you have more RAM, you do have more video memory, so your GPU performance would actually be far greater than just those two extra cores. And the third best option is the 10-core CPU, the 24-core GPU, and 32 gigabytes of RAM for $2,900. So this gives you a 50% boost in GPU performance, and one extra H.265 and 264 encode engine, and 
one extra ProRes encode and decode engine. So video exports would be much faster here. And on top of that, we also have support for four external monitors rather than just two. If you're wondering which one I got, I got a 10 core CPU, 32 core GPU, 32 gigabytes of RAM and one terabyte of storage. Now, I know I don't need that much GPU performance for what I'm doing, but uh, I do want to keep this machine for around four years or even more. So I wanted to future proof it as much as possible. The only thing that I'm concerned about when it comes to these new MacBook Pros is the battery life, which is significantly worse than on the M1. Still better than on the Intel models, but coming from the M1, I think I will definitely notice the drop. Regardless, they're great machines and we'll be doing loads of very detailed performance tests, so definitely make sure you subscribe to the channel to see those as soon as we get them in the studio next week. I'm Daniel, this has been Zenof Tech, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Zenof Tech, signing out. Cheers.